So my name is Taylor and I'm the Youth Campus Coordinator at the BGCL. And this is Andrea, I'll let her introduce herself. Hello, my name is Andrea Brennan and I am ordained in the Anglican Church and I work in the Anglican Church and I'm on loan to the United Church in Fernie. Nice. So I'm going to ask you some questions and then for the youth, if you guys have questions after you can feel free to send us a message and we'll be happy to answer those for you. So our first question is what do you do for a living? Well, I am a priest slash minister in shared ministry. So I work for the Anglican Church and the United Church in Fernie. Nice. And how did you get into that career? Because God asked me to. I know that sounds obnoxious and ridiculous, but I went on retreat about 20 years ago, having a conversation with God and with myself. Do I want to go into a monastic lifestyle? Do I want to be a nun? Yes, Anglicans have nuns. Or do I want to become an Anglican priest? And so to make a long and complicated story short, um, I was sitting outside in a grotto. So it's uh, like a stone statue and there was water and trees. It was a really beautiful place. And very clearly I heard a voice say, Andrea, you will serve me. My first reaction to this was, are you kidding me? And I ran into the building and talked to the guest sister. And I'm like, are there any men on site? And she said, no. I'm like, no, no, like, she said, no, it's all, all women on campus. And I'm like, oh, so didn't say anything to anybody because I thought the cheese has finally slid off the cracker. At the end of the week, because I was there for five days, at the end of the week, I went back, sat in the same place. And every day I went and sat in the same place and nothing happened. The last day I'm like, okay, if you're serious, here I am. This is your last chance. And again, I heard, you will serve me. And I'm like, well, so then I went in to talk to the guest sister again. And I said, so I've had this calling that I'm supposed to serve. And I'm thinking maybe I'm supposed to be a nun. And she's like, no, uh-uh, no, no. And I'm like, how much do you suck if the nuns don't even want you? Like, seriously, you think that they'd be, you know, calling for people to do this, but I'm too strong an introvert because for the first seven years till you take your final vows as a nun, you have no privacy other than in the bathroom. And I'm like, yeah, that's not gonna work. So <laughs> I am. <laughs> that was a good story, I enjoyed it. <laughs> Um, so what does the day to day look like for you in this field? Um, it changes a lot. I uh, Sundays uh, worship is at 10 o'clock in the morning. And now with pandemic, we meet by Zoom. So we have our congregation coming together from the United Church and the Anglican Church. Um, we have folks that join us from um, from British Columbia, from Alberta, from Montana, Texas, Florida. Ontario and Bristol, England. Nice. That's, so that's cool. A Sunday. That it's such a vast place. It's very cool. It never would have happened. I mean, one of the benefits of COVID is that it's really brought us into what shared ministry is. Mm -hmm. um, and then during the week, it's writing the sermon, it's getting the worship notes together, putting the slides together, um, talking to people, uh, getting yelled at, you know, fun things like that. Um, because I work in the entertainment industry, the hospitality industry, um, I work in daycare and elder care, depending on who it is that I'm talking to. So it's, you know, to say this is what's going to happen on Monday, it never works like that, ever. Very flexible. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, okay, what kind of training or education did you have to do? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, to be ordained in the Anglican Church, um, ideally ideally, you have a three or four year undergraduate degree in any subject at all. Mine was in English literature and philosophy with a theater minor, which is a wonderful degree that, you know, you have the phrase, would you like fries with that? Um, I wasn't able to get work in my field. I'd intended to be a teacher. Um, and then I had been um, involved in my church and had become a lay minister. And my priest said, would you consider parish ministry? And I'm like, ah, Oh, shit, you're serious. Um, so then I had to go to uh, university again to get a three year Master of Divinity. Um, ideally, you do it three years full time, but I couldn't just do that. So I did it five years, um, three years part time, two years full time. So you need ideally an undergrad degree and then um, a three year Master of Divinity. Nice. Okay. And how would someone go about getting a job in this field after they've gone through the education requirements? 
Well, you kind of need, it's a little bit backwards because you're working with the diocese and you're working with um, with the school at the same time. If you show up at a diocesan office and say, ooh, shiny, brand new MDiv, they say that's nice and send you on your way for a while. Um, ideally, you want to be working with a church. So if you are attending a church and you're feeling that you want something more, um, you're feeling that you'd like to be in leadership. Um, so to get into the field, what usually happens is somebody says, hey, have you ever considered? And usually the first reaction is, are you nuts? And then, you know, you work with it. So there's the concurrent um, that someone has recognized a call in you and then you go away to discern, like, am I really called to this or that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, what are some of the challenges you face in this career? Well, um, I'm 53 and I'm part of the youth group in my church. It's it's an aging demographic. Um, you would probably be in the nursery because you're <laughs> younger than me. Um, it's you you have to be very flexible. Um, you have to have um, very you've got to have the height of a rhino um, because when people are upset, um, when they trust you, they're going to lose their shit on you in nice and not so nice ways. Um, I have a parishioner whose husband died and I couldn't preside the funeral because I was recovering from um, very significant surgery and she's never forgiven me. So she, when she gets mad, it's my fault. And I really, so it's, it's understanding that sometimes when the shit's being flung, it's your shit. Sometimes when the shit's being flung, it's somebody else's. So it's figuring that out. Um, the challenge is like anything else, where's the church going to be in 10 years? Where's the church going to be in 20 years? Are we going to be relevant? And one of the things that we've seen with COVID is that there are people who are really looking for a worshiping community. And so we have, I mean, my congregation, the Anglican congregation, we were averaging 15 to 25 people on a Sunday. United Church congregation between 5 and 15. We're now averaging 50 on a Sunday online. And that's 50 devices. There might be more than one person, but when you're um, when you're doing Zoom, you have the little thing that says participants and how many. That's the number I record. There could be 25 people at a count. I don't give a shit. I'm just looking at the numbers that are on the participants. Nice. So yeah. Okay. And the last question is: Do you have any advice for somebody who's looking at going into this field, or what would you tell somebody who's interested in this? Being completely obnoxious, I would look straight into the camera and say, don't do it. Um, but the reality is, if this is something that you really feel a call to, um, one of the things that you need to do is to find yourself a mentor, somebody that will be your friend, but somebody that will say stuff that nobody else will say to you. Um, I have a wonderful um, spiritual advisor, and there's times that she'll say to me, no, nah, you're full of that's not how it goes. And it's important to have those people in your life. It's important to have um, a counselor. Um, it's important to be open with your story. Like I struggle with mental illness and um, my congregation is aware of this. And when I'm having a rough week, I'll tell them I'm having a rough week. You also need to be prepared for people to comment on every aspect of your parents and life. It's like you live, you know, those hamster balls that they run around in. I feel like that's what I live in. So you need to be prepared for that to happen. Is it appropriate? No. Is it going to happen? Yes. And um, if you're going into ministry and you're fairly young, expect to get your cheeks pinched. <laughs> expect to get physically patted on the head and, oh, aren't you cute? Because every church wants a 25-year-old with 30 years experience. Um, I mean, it is, it's a wonderful, I, I, it's, it sounds like I hate what I do. I don't. I love what I do and I'm good at what I do. Um, you get to be with people, what we call the hatch, match, and dispatch. So, you know, birth, um, death, um, well, birth, marriage, and death. Um, and so we're brought into people's lives when they're at their most vulnerable, when they're at their most excitable. And so you become part of the family. They become part of the church family. You become part of their family. Um, so you need to be upfront. You need to be who you are, because if you try to be anybody else, you'll get busted pretty quick. Perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you Faith so much. For You're welcome. Sorry, I was just going to say, to sum it up, two things, rhino hide, faith in God, not necessarily in that order. Okay. Well, thank you for your time. And again, for the youth that are watching this, if you have any questions, feel free to just send us a message and we'll be happy to answer it for you. And uh, thank you.